This is Epicenter, episode 320. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. Well, it is still the holidays and we are still on break. So for the very last episode of the year, we're bringing you a panel discussion which took place at macro.wtf, which was a side event of SF Blockchain Week. Now, if you're not familiar with the WTF Collective, they've organized two events so far, uh, one during DEF CON in Osaka, which was called DeFi.wtf, and then the second event, macro.wtf, during SF Blockchain Week. And I'm quite sure they'll be organizing more events during you know major blockchain weeks in 2020. So macro.wtf was all about the intersection between macroeconomics and crypto, and Sunny was co-organizer. So this particular panel is called Monetary Systems in an International Context, and it's all about reshaping our thinking around international political economies. The panelists were John P. Conley, who's a professor of economics at Vanderbilt University, Bak Kim, who is an investor at Hashed, Jay Kwan, the inventor of Tendermint, and Steve Walderman, who is an economics blogger at interfluidity.com. Sunny moderated this panel, and I thought it was an interesting conversation because I learned about existing problems and issues in monetary policy and economics, and how economists are already projecting how these problems could carry over into the crypto space. And in some ways, as we'll see in the conversation, already are starting to emerge in the crypto space, and how that could affect things like monetary policy and stable coins, and to a larger extent, governance of crypto networks. So it was a really cool conversation. I really hope you'll enjoy it. Now, the audio on this panel isn't great because it was recorded on a camera but we did try to clean it up as much as possible so that it's at least pleasant to listen to. So I am now off on vacation. I'm going to be completely offline for a week. At least that's the plan. I hope I can make it. But uh, we'll be back here in January with brand new episodes. On January 7th, we'll release our interview with Charlie Schramm, which was absolutely fantastic. I'm so looking forward to putting it out. But until then, I want to wish you all a very happy new year. Enjoy the celebrations, be safe, but have fun, and we'll see you back here in January. Before we go to the panel, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor for today's episode, and that is Pepo. Pepo is a community of content creators sharing short video content on crypto and entrepreneurship. And what's really interesting about Pepo is the way that you show your love for content. When you like something on Pepo, you tip the content creator with Pepo coins. And when you want to take part in a conversation, you show your interest by putting up Pepo coins as well. So on Pepo, you'll find an interesting community of people sharing short 30-second videos. They're sharing your thoughts on crypto. They're sharing your thoughts on entrepreneurship. And the community is growing. It's still small, but it's growing. And the conversations are really interesting and I think really high quality. I always learn something when I'm scrolling through my Pepo feed. So if you want to take part in this growing community, you can download Pepo for iOS or Android. That's P-E-P-O. You log in with your Twitter account and they'll even give you some Pepo coins so you can start tipping people. And if you create content, you can also earn Pepo coins as well. And of course, you can find me there. My username is Seb2.0, Seb2, P-O-I-N-T-0. I regularly post content there and interact with the community and would love to see you there too and have a chat with you on Pepo. We'd like to thank Pepo for their support of Epicenter. And with that, here is Monetary Systems in an International Context moderated by Sunny Agarwal. So yeah, uh, the goal of this panel is we're heavily going to sort of explore a lot of monetary policy, which is what we've been talking about thus far, but then what happens when it starts to come back into, when you put it in an international context. And so, yeah, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Sunny. Uh, I was one of the uh, co-organizers for this event, and I'm a, uh, one of the researchers at Cosmos. And I've been kind of really been deep diving into the monetary theory lately. Um, I've been taking, I took a course on Coursera called Economics of Money and Banking, which I heavily recommend everyone take. And it basically just made me rethink everything I've been doing for the last three years, and which kind of inspired me to throw this event to kind of help me learn more. 
Zaki uh, couldn't make it to the, uh, this panel today. He was on the panel earlier this morning, so instead we have Jay, and I'll let him introduce himself. Thanks, honey. My name is Jay Kwan. I invented Tendermint, co-founded Tendermint, the company, and uh, worked on Cosmos as well. And along the way, so I mean, all of that started in 2014, and since then, I've become more aware of what's happening to the environment and how there needs to be a global coordinated effort to combat it, I think, or at least first consensus that it is a problem. And I realized, especially after Libra came out, when Libra came out, it came clear that we're at an inflection point where cryptocurrencies will become this, it, it will become the new money. And it got me worried because a consortium of for-profit companies should not be dominating our, uh, our monetary system. And I think we need to really ask the question, what monetary system do we need in order to promote better balance with the environment and, um, and promote you know, our communities? That's why I'm here. Thank you. I'm still John Conley. My specialties are game theory, theoretical economics, uh, operations research, axiomatics, things like that. Um, I've been interested in ICT economics since uh, about 2009, looking at cloud computing initially and then on internet and so on. Uh, spent a sabbatical year at Microsoft Research in 2016-17 and got interested in photography, biometrics, uh, systems design, uh, networks and so on. And uh, I'm really happy with these consensus protocols that I observed and so that led me to use the skills I had in game theory to try to develop a new one, and that's uh, that's the Geek project that was mentioned here, and it's a consensus protocol called Proof of Honesty, and uh, now I'm here. Hi, I'm Steve Waldman. I uh, sometimes an economics writer. I write the blog Interfluidity. Yeah, I'm sometimes an Ethereum developer. I think similarly to my co-panelists, I got interested in this stuff because you know the world is going to shit in a lot of ways across so many dimensions and um, I think that we need a lot of institutional innovation and mostly what interests me about blockchains is that they're sort of superficially technical systems but they're really fundamentally social institutions reified in a technical way that make a lot of things that are sort of tacit or opaque very visible and auditable and so that's the optimistic case for these things. But there are a lot of pessimistic cases, so um, Jaquan's discussion of Libra, that these technical architectures don't carry social virtue with them for free. We have to build things that are good, and I think it's a very open question whether what we are currently in the middle of doing will result in good things or not. Let's try to make that happen. Hi, I'm Beck. Uh, I'm a robotics engineer by training, uh, turned crypto investor. Pash is a crypto native uh, cross border ambassador. Uh, we back over 50 companies, including Cosmos initially. And we invest, especially in the Asia side, uh, international companies that are building blockchain protocols. Some of them are public blockchains. And these are touching some of the regulators on some of their monetary policy and how they impact some of their e uh, e-commerce uh, payments as well. Uh, Sunny reached out to me uh, and to share a little bit more about some of the Libra's impact on KRW. So Korean government has been paying strong attention into crypto ecosystem because of the high penetration rate of crypto. Uh, the survey shows that around third of the white collar population has touched cryptocurrency at some point. And in Korea, about 90% of the payments are cashless. So it's all electronic. So it's a really easy uh, environment for this kind of uh, product to widespread and take over possibly fiat. And KRW itself, uh, you know, as a country with the neighbors of a strong economy such as Japanese yen, RMB, and USD, it is highly Im impacted by some of their monetary policy changes. But if you look at uh, Libra, and as Jay mentioned, if we can actually reach that inflection point uh, and reach the hope, the high potential, it could be the another uh, biggest monetary system that KRW have to deal with. So that has been a big attention uh, for the government and the ecosystem. Cool. So I guess I'd like to start by introducing one of the uh, corner ideas that I've really been thinking about, especially when it comes to the 
international uh, monetary systems. And I'm sure uh, a number of the people on the panel might be aware of this idea, but uh, just to give some background to the audience, there's this uh, concept called uh, Roderick's Trilemma, or the, the Trilemma of the Political Economy, proposed by a uh, professor at Harvard, uh, Danny Roderick. And what he proposes is this trilemma. Uh, you know, we're very familiar with trilemmas here in the crypto space. But the one that he proposes is about economics and politics. And the three points of the system are, he called, uh, I'll put it in my terms, uh, I think some of his terminology is a bit odd, but um, I would say globalization, national sovereignty, and democratic control over monetary policy. And he basically says you have to choose two of three. And so we have diff we've seen different uh, regimes where we have tried all three of these. So the gold standard is famously the most pop, uh, the one in which we choose national sovereignty and uh, globalization, where we have these fixed exchange rates between countries. You have high amount of national sovereignty, but now you uh, don't have any sort of democratic control over decision making. Then we have uh, you can choose globalization and democratic control, but you lose out on national sovereignty. And this is sort of what Keynes proposed in his Bancor plan. Uh, it's also what the euro kind of attempts to do, not at the global scale, but maybe at the European scale. And then finally, we have what's the Bretton Woods Compromise or, you know, the post-Bretton Woods uh, order where uh, we have free floating exchange rates. We, we need capital controls in order to maintain a uh, level of national sovereignty. So with that in mind, I guess my question is, to start off, is are we in the right point on this trade-off point. Because currently the world that we live in is primarily focused on still in that Bretton Woods-like system where we, ignore, we we give up on a lot of the, nationaliza uh, the globalization that is possible. And we have some pockets where we're trying more large-scale federalism like the European Union. We're, you see this is where we're going to continuously to go. Are we going to see more pockets like the EU or are we going to see things devolve like that? I think we have to design our systems based on the facts. The facts of the environment is, the fact of the world is we share this earth, we share the air, and if you know the environment goes to shit, it affects all of us. And many things affect all of us, like um, political turmoil causes uh, refugees, so on, or collapses trade, or right. So, so there's something about the global I think that that needs to be taken into account in order to. For, for everyone who wants to participate voluntarily to globally enforce or incentivize certain things. But on the other hand, we don't know what the best system is. We need decentralization experimentation. So we also need states or local localities to have their own policies too. So I think, I think you can't choose one or the other in terms of globalization, whatever that means, and nation states. I think you need a balance because, because you, you need both. I don't like being told what to do. I prefer to do what I like to do. And to the extent that I don't cause harm to other people, that should probably be what I'm allowed to do. But there are externalities. You can, you can pollute the air. You can uh, mislabel food. There are all kinds of things that have enormous impacts on the rest of people, even at a global scale. The problem is that you can't really necessarily trust the central authorities to internalize those externalities correctly. As soon as you focus power, well, then the power focuses on itself. So it's not clear what the right thing to do is. I think, I think the, what I would try to do is, is design things as much as possible so that individuals make decisions and don't cause externalities and reserve the minimum possible for the, the higher authority. And that's one reason I like crypto, that it's, I think, the only technological thing that we have that's, that's big right now that moves in the direction of decentralization, AI, machine learning, big data, universal connectivity, IoT, all of these things are instruments of centralization, control, and uh, network externalities. So I think if we have hope, it's somewhere in blockchain. So just to push on that a little bit, whose externalities are we measuring? Are we trying to um, you know, aggregate the externalities of the people within the United States, or do we do it at a global scale? If we make monetary decisions, that have externalities on the economy of Korea, for example. Is that an acceptable moral, or is it okay to make monetary decisions of the United States when maybe have negative externalities on the uh, economies of other countries? What I want my government to do is take care of me. And at every level, I want my government to do that. I want my city government to take care of me as a city. 
I want my state government to take care of me as a state. I don't really want my government thinking about Alabama or New York that much because that's not their, not their job. They're looking after me. Um, there's a degree of benevolence, though. I mean, I, I would be upset if my government was doing really malicious, horrible things that would upset my sense of ethics and morality. But I think the first the, the first responsibility of any hierarchical unit is to take care of the, the people that it's it's over. You take care of your family, your boss. You know, it's not the job of my boss to worry about other companies. He worries about his company. So. And then uh, legally made a point, I think it's just a balance of power, right? Like, even in the fiat world, like not, it doesn't work like we described that they take a kind of all the externalities, making sure all the parties involved are okay. In the crypto landscape, I think many of the projects are doing this in a way that they can become bigger, too big to be shut down, rather than asking for some of the admission into the system or acceptance. I think regarding Libra, since it's uh, some one of the topic, uh, one thing that I thought was maybe wrong position was that they didn't even launch it, but they just proposed the idea, but they made it too public early uh, without becoming too big enough with the uh, strong incentive alignments with all these partners before making it that this info is all laid out in the system of their social uh, graphs. And I think one of the uh, good approach that I like is like, uh, one is like Terra. Uh, it's a stable coin project, uh, starting in Korea, built on Tendermint. And, you know, they abstract out whole crypto component and make it as a, just a good payment product. And now it's doing, uh, 500k sign users within three months with around two to three million dollar transaction per day. And government don't really see it as a, you know, threat. Maybe yet, <laughs> but you know, if it reaches the whole you know digital payment landscape that I mentioned, which is ninety percent of the whole Korea, um, it could be too big for it to be shut down. So I like this kind of approach rather than uh, thinking about all this intertwined uh, uh, power balance in the crypto landscape. How about the, the many other stable coins? For example, you know, uh, we had some presentations from Celo earlier. Right. Uh, many of the stable coins are trying to make themselves stable against the U.S. dollar. And does, and by promoting it uh, as the as currency for use all over the world, are, are are we essentially promoting the this idea that the U.S. should control the United States should control the monetary policy of the economies throughout the world? And so is that one? So what was your I guess in a way, what was from the reason you you used in choosing the SBR? I mean, had a researcher of Terra Nicholas right there. Uh, but one of the reasons, uh, the core reason, was that you know even USD is volatile. And as you see, we see with the U.S. and China tension, you know, pegging to a single dollar, a uh, single monetary policy can be volatile uh, for the whole crypto ecosystem. And SDR is one of the most, I think, the most uh, stable currency bucket right now with the fiat. Um, so I think it makes sense. I think Libra is also pegged to SDR currently. I'd like to answer your original question about the about uh, Danny Roderick's dilemma. I, I'm going to be sort of the opposite of my neighbor uh, a little bit, uh, although very much share the inclination towards decentralization as a design goal, a little bit more pessimistic about the possibility that in the world that we live in, externalities can be disentangled. So a, a libertarian universe looks very nice to the degree that we can kind of localize the effect of our actions. We should have liberty where we don't hurt or adversely affect other people. And unfortunately, I think we are in a time of great crisis, and a significant part of that crisis is that libertarianism worked pretty well, especially in the United States, which was a big, not very dense country, when technology didn't bring us all together as much, when our economy was a little bit less developed, when there was a stronger notion of the local. And I think that what we're struggling through right now, and, and crypto is kind of a part of this, is that when there are externalities, we need to be enfranchised. There's going to have to be some kind of a decision-making system beyond we have the liberty to do what we want, and we need to be enfranchised in that system. And what Roderick's dilemma points to is there's a tremendous um, tension between, from an economic development perspective, you want a global system. It's, for sort of standard economic reasons, has a lot to offer. But from an enfranchisement perspective, you really want things to be local. Um, and so the Bretton Woods Compromise was after the experience of the wars that came from a similar period of globalization followed by backlash of people who felt like they no longer had communities or a say or left out. 
and a retrenchment towards a much more national world. And I think we're reliving exactly the same struggle, exactly the same events. We'll need to have in the short term exactly the same set of outcomes, which is to say we've gone through a period of, in Roderick's trilemma, neoliberal technocracy, where we're, we've been part of a global economy from which we've been disenfranchised, from which we haven't had any meaningful democratic input, and we've rejected it, right? Trump is a rejection of that. Brexit is a rejection of that. All of the various anti-liberal authoritarians who are rising up around the world are basically people trying to sort of take back more organic communities from this neoliberal technocratic version of the world. But we can't actually go back to local, to sort of the part of the, tri of the triangle that is we're enfranchised in our nation state but disentangled economically. We have the democracy and the markets but not the globalism because we're much too entangled. So crypto, in my view, the re one reason to be interested in it is one way or another, we have to figure out democratic institutions that will get us to the global democracy side of the triangle, where we do have a global economy because we can't help it, but where we have a meaningful kind of democracy that enfranchises all of us, that doesn't have us feel like we're falling behind, that we're left behind, like we're crushed, we're oppressed, we're ignored. And we just have a limited time as a, as a species to figure out how to organize a meaningful global system in which we feel enfranchised and the institutional development aspect of crypto, the, the idea of being able to build new kinds of institutions, new kinds of voting systems and organizations, I think optimistically might pay a, play a crucial part in that. Um, in the meantime, until we get better institutions, we're going to retrench into a more national world because it's the only way we don't tear ourselves apart. So I used to be a libertarian. I got better. Um, it's a disease of youth. But um, no, I mean, I, I like your program. I wish, the concern I have is this, that the more local you are, the smaller your group, the bigger you say, and the more likely it is to reflect your preferences. So I'm not saying that you can reduce problems to your group, but I say to whatever extent you can, that's the preferred option. Now, the problem with global or even large kinds of, of voting is, well, this is why economists have no friends, because we know about impossibility theorems. Uh, there's the arrow impossibility theorem, there's, there's saddled weight, there's impossibility of preference aggregation. It just turns out that as it's even an abstract exercise, you really cannot in, a, in any reasonable way that satisfies any reasonable set of conditions let people uh, express preferences in a way that doesn't really come to disaster. It's just not possible. I mean, I wish it was, I really do. And I, I would love to have a global government that was good and nice and beneficent, but the theory says no, and I think the empirical evidence is not so strong either. I actually agree with everyone here, <laughs> and I don't think. <laughs> no, that's what I'm trying to say. Is um, when I say I want some global aspect of the economy, I'm not saying I want a global government that where where I'm bound to. Uh, I am only promoting voluntary associations, and I think. Basically, by enabling people to create their own monetary systems and to have competition of fiat, we will be able to create a system that balances the needs of local and monetary needs as well as global coordination. By having competition of many global models and allowing people to freely associate, I think we will come up with the best set of balances. Uh, just one more thing. The reason why I believe this so strongly, look, like, my dad lost his job, uh, or the company that I was working for folded because of the IMF crisis, uh, due to the way that the um, you know interest rates were changed by the, and then the housing crisis too affected my family the same. So at this point, I don't want to be bound by any fiat currency. I would rather die than be held to a decree that says I have to use this money because I don't support this money system. I don't support the dollar. I don't support the wars that we're waging. I want to stop using it. So, Steve, I mean, a lot of your talk was about how the system, like, you know, the slavery system that fiat creates is somewhat beneficial still to running a well-functioning society. So what would you say to Jay, for example, about, like, could we ever have, a, like, you know, one of the topics here is the Hayekian denationalization of money. Is that ever possible in a world in which fiat currency exists, in which the government requires taxes in one currency? Governments have a, a tremendous advantage at defining what gets to be the sort of high network effect currency because they uniquely have the, the, have the capacity 
to create that obligations ex nihilo, from nothing. So anything can kind of be monetized. We can coordinate on cigarettes or gold or whatever for a while. But the reason why states are really good at it is that they can make something desirable by fiat, by saying you have to pay taxes in it. You know, it's a little bit like Facebook. I hate Facebook and want to see it erased from the earth. Just sort of make that plain. But it's really hard to deal with because they have this tremendous network effect and social networks really do have value associated with the network effect. So fiat currencies or currencies in general have a tremendous network effect. There's a tremendous benefit to having one that everybody uses. So given that governments have this capacity to make the thing that they issue to give an advantage to the thing that they issue as a currency, become a a currency coordination point. They have a tremendous advantage, and those things want to be big. I don't really see a role for kind of as a general purpose currency for lots of little things interacting with one another. I want to caveat that on the sort of institutional side, because I think, you know, I, I don't actually disagree all that much with my neighbor. I think it's critically important as much as possible to create notions of locality for ourselves because our, our larger affiliations, are always, we're always going to be unhappy with them to some degree. And within smaller communities, one way that you can kind of bind together, give sort of sinews and blood to a smaller community is by having the community sort of describe patterns of how economic value flows. And those can be expressed as something like a complementary currency. So I can see a world in which there are lots of, quote, denationalized money that are kind of the scripts or tokens of local or intense or very, you know, small, not necessarily very small, but small relative to the nation state communities. But I don't think we're going to get to a world of kind of competing monies for general purpose commerce. Okay. So you did mention earlier about, the, you know, maybe we can build the democratic tools to like make a global governance possible to an extent. You know, I think the best example case we have today is uh, the, the Eurozone. And we, you know, they've successfully created a monetary union, but they have un- been unable to create a fiscal union. And what makes us think that we can uh, do that in a global sense if we can't even do it in the European sense? And like when it comes to Libra, for example, we can't even get European countries that share like a European union to pool risk, to issue common bonds. How can we get these multinational companies with like competing interests to do so? Well, I think we probably shouldn't. I mean, the reason that Greece and Germany don't have a common current, uh, common fiscal policy is that Greeks are not Germans. And they have not only behaved differently, they have different preferences. They wish to behave differently. And the policy that's right for the Germans is not right for the Greeks. And so there's a reason to have separation between the fiscal policies. Do you think it's possible to create a, a, a long-term sustainable monetary union if you don't create fiscal union? Uh, well, like I say, I, there, it's always a balance, right? There's the externality, there's the, the network externality benefit of, of getting together, but then there's the loss of, uh, of uh, personal preference and uh, choice uh, if you do that. And the, it's, always, it's a balance. You know, there's not a, there's not a single right answer. It's my personal opinion, I'm still learning this, uh, that, that the EU should not have had the euro, that, that the, the benefit of a single currency is not you know, that great. Um, you can construct other means on top of individual states' currencies and, uh, and, and make it all work. The reason why I think we need something global is primarily to deal with things that are naturally global, such as dealing with the environment. You know, there should be a global system for uh, incentivizing the uh, planting of trees and carbon sequestration. And I'm not suggesting that this system needs to be forced on everyone, but states or towns, for example, can participate voluntarily if they so choose to. I think if we find the right model that has the right legitimacy with the right transparency and accountability that makes the right decisions, then I think people will choose to fund it and associate with it. Uh, so you say that, like, you know, it's up to states to kind of do this voluntarily, participate in this. When it comes to like environmental issues, what, what happens when there's like states that don't want to participate? Like if they they don't want to sacrifice economic productivity for environment. Like it, it's a large scale prisoner's dilemma where we're all getting pennies worth of doom, but no one wants to be the one to fix it. Mm, I, I so suppose, you yeah. need to do some sort of enforcement and force. 
Not so much an enforcement from the top, but more like from the peers. So, for example, you can have a union of peers that say, well, we're going to uh, not trade with this partner until they adopt something sensible, for example. Okay. Um, so, as Steve said, uh, I think fiat currency having the governance of the, gov uh, the nations forcing it has a big power in keeping everything within the same network effect. But I also agree with uh, Jay, and also what Jay shared remind me of uh, some idea, like just one idea that I was like tossing around with my friends around, um, you know, today uh, super rich or even just like top maybe 1% are kind of free from jurisdictions in terms of their financial wealth or their activities. And I think with the cryptocurrency, with, and we see a lot of crypto wells in a lot of conferences, they're very global and they're kind of abstracted away from the nationalities and also the fiat world. Um, so in the future, like some people say that, you know, this crypto governance uh, brings people from decentralized communities into more back to like nomadic communities. So maybe uh, this, you know, wealth accumulating up in the virtual world, like cryptocurrency side, could lead to next generation of DAOs that uh, represent, you know, like kind of voluntary nationalities that is aligned within the ones that have share similar interests and uh, maybe the denationalization of money. Yeah. Some of us are starting a project called Virgo, and it is to create an association of uh, technologists, but also economists and so on, in order for us to not only decentralize our social media, communications, our financial systems, and our governance systems, but ultimately so we can answer questions like, what should our monetary system be, and solve for things like global warming. Uh, it's not a tech-centric you know, we're not. We're starting it as an uh, as a people centric organization and project. So uh, please join us at virgo.org. You'll see a manifesto and links to a forum. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter Podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>